Hiring the wrong executive costs you time and money. Leveraging work psychology, Spear Consulting helps you hire the right executive so you can focus on growing your business. For a free quote, visit spiritmco.com. Enjoy the show. Welcome back to the Tips for Team Building podcast, where our mission is to inspire and propel others along in their leadership journeys. Uh, I'm your host, Jaden Smith, and so excited to welcome Michael Yost to the show. Michael, thanks for uh, taking the time. For those who don't know you, we always start with a little bit of a softball. Uh, so our first question is, who are you? Yeah, well, thanks, Jaden, for having me today. Um, so who am I? Um, I'll start by saying from a, a personal standpoint, uh, I'm a Christian. I'm a husband, uh, a father, and uh, and a sports fan. So um, and I also say that naturally I'm a, I'm a competitor. And so uh, professionally, I am uh, responsible for leading the Total Reward Center of Excellence for our health system and our HR Performance Center. And so our health system is about 18,000 employees, um, which spans across um, Louisiana and Mississippi. And in my role, I'm uh, privileged to lead a team of about 55 um, stellar employees who really just you know, make me proud every day of what they accomplish. Awesome. So that's me in a nutshell. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, a lot of a lot of pieces that that make up Michael as a person. Uh, yeah. You mentioned being a sports fan. What what uh, what sports are you into and what what are your teams? So the fall is uh, obviously football time. So we're coming up on that now. Um, I'm a huge Michigan uh, Wolverine fan. So I love college football. Um, I, I certainly love NFL, too, but college football is my go to. So Saturdays in the fall are usually filled with that. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. And I've got my IU degree behind me, but I can't even give you any grief for being a Michigan fan because our football team is not very good. Uh, but yeah, big, uh, okay. big football fan as well. And definitely a big 10 fan. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Michael, you, you shared kind of a little bit um, about your role um, at FMOL health and um, you know, just kind of curious if you could, you know, obviously you didn't get into a role like this overnight. So could you kind mm-hmm. of highlight for us um, how you got gotten into the leadership position that you're in today? Yeah, absolutely. So when I think of the the journey that I've had to kind of get where I am today, um, you know, I'll start by saying that I never envisioned myself at a young age as being a leader. And so there's uh, definitely been stages uh, throughout my career to this point in my life that have shaped me on who I am today. Um, so if we go back to my early years, I grew up in uh, Southern Illinois uh, and I was uh, often described as a, a reserved and, and a quiet, you know, uh, kid by my teachers. And so when I grew up in my teenage years and I, I you know, played football and kind of grew my social circle, but I still was very much reserved uh, you know, and I, I dreaded going into those public speaking, speaking courses, um, and happen to give presentations in front of individuals. So that gives you a sense for what kind of a, a, a teenager I was. But, um, after, after high school, I graduated, you know, and went to a local community college, uh, applied for Pell Grants and financial aid. Um, and then, you know, I, I really was at a point where I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my career. And I, I knew I, you know, there were a couple of options that were interesting to me, um, whether that be being a police officer um, or the military service. Because I knew a couple of um, the people that I grew up with in high school that had went that path. Um, and I also knew I didn't want to stay in Southern Illinois forever and wanted to kind of get out and start my own life. So I started looking into the military. Yeah, I chose the army because at the time they would guarantee me a job that I chose as long as I qualified for it. And, uh, and would pay for my college degree. And so you know, I went through the process of signing up for the Army um, at the Military Entrance Processing Center um, or the MAPS in, in St. Louis, took the ASVAB test, um, took the physical test, and then I met with a career counselor to kind of go over some options for jobs that the Army had uh, that I qualified for. And I had a couple of different choices. Uh, there was obviously the jobs, the combat-related jobs like infantry, we also had finance, IT, um, and HR available to choose from. And so at that time, admittedly, I was a little bummed because uh, the, the military police wasn't a, a job that was available for me. Uh, and I can tell you at that young age of 18, had it been available, I, I certainly would have uh, went that route. But it wasn't. 
And so uh, I remember, you know, talking to the career counselor about the different jobs and ultimately landed on HR because it provided me a lot of different opportunities within the human resources career field that I could pursue. And uh, I would be able to spend time taking the college classes while I was working full time. So uh, I left a couple months later and went into um, basic training for the Army, which was uh, about nine, nine weeks long. And then I went into immediately after that, the advanced individual training um, or AIT, which is kind of like the, the job training for the Army. And it was, a, it was about an, an additional uh, eight weeks. So that was mostly in a classroom environment where you know, I learned about the Army's HR policies, their processes and, and systems. And so what I can tell you is that that nine weeks of basic training and eight weeks of, of job training was really impactful for me. Um, because I had left home and started my own life you know, at 18 and, and really was surrounded by people I didn't know. And over, um, over the course of that period of time, you know, I was learning some basic leadership skills like the self-discipline and, um, you know, the importance of um, an understanding of teamwork. And so and I think that part of my like, leadership journey Really, you know, it helped me to, to become kind of that informal leader, which, you know, I didn't have that leadership title, but the responsibility um, was focused more around, you know, focusing on how to be a role model for how I want others to behave and developing more of that interest and in standing out and, and, and uh, having that desire to be considered for future leadership opportunities. So after uh, basic training and, and job training, um, I went to Fort Riley, Kansas. It was my first duty station. I worked in, um, in a division headquarters there. It was kind of a, a rare opportunity for somebody straight out of training. Um, usually you're assigned to more of, um, you know, uh, lower kind of company or uh, battalion level um, assignment. And so that was really a, a neat experience for me to, to work with some higher ranking officers um, and senior enlisted folks. But um, I was able to get, you know, promoted through some waivers. Um, and uh, one day my department head came to, um, to myself and others and asked as if we, anyone was interested in going to, um, an uh, individual augmentee assignment that was over in Afghanistan to join a joint force uh, unit that was over there. And so you'd be serving with not just the U S forces, but also, um, other countries, militaries. And so I immediately raised my hand. I didn't have to think about it um, and, and went over there and volunteered um, where I spent a, about a year um, stationed in Kabul, Afghanistan. So I was able to, you know, support theater wide HR operations. Um, and about six, six months into that assignment, I was promoted to sergeant and uh, began what I would call more of that hands on you know, kind of leadership journey. Uh, where I was, you know, involved in the day-to-day -day contributions of the team and obviously helped them out as, as necessary. And so I, I just had a small team. It was about three, three junior enlisted um, HR specialists, one from the Army, one from Air Force, and, and one from the Navy, and then reported to a Marine Corps um, lieutenant colonel at the time. And so, you know, that was that was a uh, really neat experience for me to be able to, you know, go over there and experience a, a diverse kind of culture and um, work with a lot of other countries, militaries, um, and I have a lot of good memories from that experience. But after that deployment, um, I returned stateside and then finished out the Army for another, another three years in uh, recruiting capacity. Um, and so all in all, I was in active duty in the Army for about a little over six years. Um, and then when I decided to transition out of the military, like many other veterans, I had some challenges uh, making that transition. Uh, but what had helped me was networking with uh, some HR leaders in the local community that I grew up in. And even though I wasn't able to secure an HR job, one of the HR leaders for uh, Pepsi had informed me about an opportunity that they were seeking uh, recently separated veterans to fill a management trainee role. And so uh, I'd applied and was fortunate enough to be hired into that role. Um, and about a month after being in that management trainee role, um, I was moved into a regional sales manager position and was able to lead a larger team um, of around 20 individuals. And so that was, you know, that was an eye opener for me. Um, I had, um, I didn't have any sales experience really at that time. Um, and, you know, they, they, they took a risk on me moving me into that role. But um, really, the, you know, the emotional intelligence 
became a differentiator for me in terms of uh, that team's success. And it was a beneficial opportunity, opportunity for me straight out of the military to be able to, to be in that kind of a role. Um, after a year of doing that, you know, I moved, um, I had an opportunity to come up within HR at a local health system. Um, and I took that role because I, I did miss uh, being in HR. It was enough for me to know that sales wasn't something that I was interested in long term. Uh, and so then I, I moved into um, an HR role with that hospital and about two years uh, with, within two years, I was promoted into the corporate benefits manager role. And then uh, later, about a year later, I moved into the director of compensation and benefits role for that system. Um, and at that point, I really transitioned into leading more of uh, the leaders. And so um, also at this point, I think it's important to point out, I, I didn't have any prior experience leading compensation for an entire health system. Uh, when, when my leader at that time, uh, who was the CHRO, offered me that director level opportunity. And so obviously another you know, kind of key learning moment for me that he was in, in willing to invest in me, uh, despite not having that, that technical expertise. And so, you know, I remember when I asked him about why he um, made that decision to put me into that role, he really said that he and, uh, believed in hiring character over skill. And so that had a tremendous um, impact on me, both developmentally and uh, from a career trajectory standpoint. Um, and so then, you know, I spent um, five years with that system, um, with HSHS, and then I was recruited to lead total rewards for Unity Point Health System uh, based out of Des Moines, Iowa. And they have about 34,000 employees across Illinois, Iowa, and Wisconsin. And uh, if not for a merger, I, I likely wouldn't um, have been open to other opportunities. Uh, but, but the unknown of what would happen around that time with the merger um, I was recruited to Franciscan Missionaries of Our Lady Health System, um, or FMOL Health System, in December of, of 2019, um, and that's um, where I serve now as the the Chief Total Rewards and HR Customer Experience Officer for the health system. Awesome, awesome. Well, thanks for outlining uh, kind of that journey, Michael. And you know, on behalf of myself and our audience, you know, appreciate your service to the country, um, and think that it's just it's so wonderful to kind of hear stories like, you know, for instance, moving into Pepsi where, you know, the focus was around, um, you know, helping uh, recently um, separated veterans and, you know, helping mm -hmm. them kind of, you know, transition into the civilian uh, life or the civilian uh, professional realm. Um, so that's incredible. Um, and that you were able to find your way back into HR. <laughs> like it's always, you know, some people like get, you know, get stuck once they, you know, maybe they take that, like that, that opportunity and they're like, oh, well, I don't really, I'm not a huge fan, but like, you know, I, I like it. I like the people or like, it's not bad enough for me to like chase my passion. Right. So for right. you to be able mm -hmm. to make that move and, and chase your passion. Uh, just kudos to you. And I think that goes back to that emotional intelligence that you were, you were talking about and that like having that high level of emotional intelligence, you know, that if you're not a hundred percent engaged and satisfied with the work, it's going to be hard to like lead that team uh, to, so to be the same way. So true. Yeah. It's so important to stay, you know, real and, and, and be authentic to those that you're leading. And so it's, it's hard to do that when you're in a, in a job or a role that you're not passionate about and don't really um, see yourself in long term. So that's true. Yeah. So, so Michael, uh, one of the, you know, you, you talked about how your CHRO at HSHS uh, mentioned that he hires character over skill. And I think that that's, that's mm -hmm. such an awesome philosophy to have. And, you know, part of part of character and people knowing that you're of high character is your ability to create meaningful relationships. Uh, so one of the questions we ask every guest on the Tips for Team Building podcast is how do you build relationships as a leader? What's your philosophy or approach? Yeah. So I would say that um, for me, what I try to do is to just be really intentional about, you know, knowing that, um, Obviously, for your role, there's going to be individuals that you're going to work with that are going to be really instrumental and helpful for you to, to be successful. Um, but 
anyone who you come in contact with. It's w- whether or not they have a direct role in, in your success or not. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> we're really, you know, meant to, um, I prescribe to the philosophy of, you know, loving others like you love yourself. And so, you know, it's, it's uh, important that everybody walks away from those conversations that I have with them feeling like, you know, I'm really listening to them and um, being present in the conversations. And so I think, uh, you know, setting aside intentional time in, in the midst of everything else that's going on uh, for whomever it is that, um, that you're dealing with that particular day is important. Um, but certainly my team and, and those that I interact with often, um, the relationships are very important and, you know, setting aside time, you know, in the, um, in the, the daily grind, you know, making sure our one-on-ones are, are very much, um, you know, time where we can spend, you know, thinking together and uh, planning and, and discussing, you know, strategic priorities, but starting off the conversations from a personal standpoint is also really important. Um, and so, you know, for me, I try to implement, um, for the, at least the first couple of minutes to talk about where we're at, uh, what's going on with them personally, um, and making sure that they understand that I really value them as a person, uh, not just what they're doing for the organization. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that that's, that's so important. Um, recognizing, you know, also that, that the, the personal does like as much as some people want to say, Oh, you put it, you leave it at the door, you walk in and you know, you don't mm-hmm. think about personal, like making sure that they're in a, a good headspace personally, I think also kind of sets the expectations for what you can expect professionally. Um, because if there is something going on personally, then, then obviously that's something that, that will likely affect the professional or has the potential to do so. Um, so absolutely. it's important to, to check in and, you know, absolutely love that philosophy. So, um, so, so Michael, you mentioned that, you know, when talking through your leadership journey, um, you chatted through, um, departing unity point and how you've recently, um, you know, within the past couple of years taken on the new position at FMOL health, mm-hmm. um, in December, 2019. And, you know, I think that right now you're seeing so many individuals either taking on new positions or thinking about taking on new positions in this very employee uh, centric, uh, you know, mo- or market right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so can you share any advice with our audience around kind of adapting, adapting to a new culture when entering a new position um, or a new organization? especially when, when entering at kind of a leadership level? Yeah, I would say for me, in my experience, and I've had, I've worked now for a couple of different companies. Um, and as you move from one company or organization to another, what has really helped me and, and can be a challenge to be uh, honest at times is your, your success and the accomplishments that you've had in the past is, um, while valuable, it's also something you need to transition from and realize that the new company, uh, there's a new culture and, uh, you, you know, you're, you're not bigger than that new culture. Um, and so you really have to be intentional and, and, uh, figure out what that new culture is and what the cultural rules are. Um, and so there's not, uh, there's not a guide or a book per se of what those cultural rules are for you to just walk in the door and, and know immediately. And so um, what's really helpful is, you know, figuring out and having sort of a game plan of how you uh, get up to speed around, um, you know, understanding the culture and, and how you fit into that, um, you know, depending on what your goals are. And um, maybe sometimes, you know, I know moving into this role for me, there was, um, a little bit of an impact right away, December of 19, when I came into FMOL Health System, um, it wasn't, but a couple of months later, the pandemic started. And so, you know, for me, I, I started to really spend the first 90 days understanding the culture, which is um, a little bit different in terms of decision making and building relationships than what it was when the pandemic started and kind of uh, changed a lot of our realities. Um, and so that was a struggle for me to have to pivot. And then, you know, I was learning, you know, in that new reality with many others. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, um, 
there's there's a couple things I think that would be helpful for others as you know that may be navigating that, which is uh, trying to understand you know are there other key leaders or maybe peers of yours that have gone through some successful initiatives recently. Uh, maybe they have navigated this and, and really can shed some light on uh, what was uh, successful for them and what kind of tactics that they used. Um, it's also helpful sometimes. I've, I've learned in my experience that the executive assistants uh, to the CEO or some senior executives also have some really good insight into uh, how decisions are made um, in the meetings that take place, sometimes meetings outside of meetings even. So, um, you know, kind of trying to figure out who the, that network of individuals is that you need to, to go to and build those relationships and get that understanding from will definitely help. Have you been feeling unfulfilled? You want to be happy, but just continue to struggle. One of the best ways to experience joy is by caring for the homeless. A charity I've grown to love, River of Light, food rescues a million meals per year for the needy in Chicago. Imagine how that make you feel, knowing that you're helping feed children and veterans. To make a tax-deductible donation, visit riveralightchicago.org. Again, riveralightchicago.org. No one should go to bed hungry. Awesome. Yeah, and I can speak. I mean, obviously, my role kind of is more external uh, to an organization versus internal as we're partnering with you know, organizations to help them hire all-star leaders. But Mm -hmm. um, I'll say that the most probably, you know, behind potentially the hiring manager we're working with, Mm -hmm. um, and even sometimes beyond that person, the most important relationship is that executive assistant or chief of staff or whoever it is who makes the things happen (laughs) is one of the most important relationships. So definitely think that that's an important point to highlight. so, Michael, you, you kind of chatted through with, um, you know, with COVID hitting it, it really kind of changed the reality of this, uh, of, you know, kind of the workforce and we're, we're switching, switching mm-hmm. things around. We're doing things differently. And I know from prior conversations, you shared that the team that you now lead at FMOL Health uh, is, is fully remote. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think that that's something that, if organizations aren't shifting to that or adding in some hybrid flexibility, um, you know, they're kind of behind the curveball at this point. So I think that you're going to see a lot more um, organizations continuing to shift, if not 100% remote, at least some remote flexibility. So would love to hear about the, the approaches and the innovative ways uh, that you are engaging remote staff. Yeah, sure. So, you know, I will say that for our organization specifically, and, and certainly every organization is going to be different in terms of how they're handling the remote work. Um, I agree with what you're saying. It's certainly an advantage and it has been for us, even as we've had openings and been able to recruit across the entire country to fill these roles, uh, which we before the pandemic weren't able to do. We had to really focus more geographically in our local markets. Um, and so we've, we've gotten some really what I would consider top tier talent to fill those roles that otherwise we wouldn't have been able to solidify. So um, in terms of engaging that talent, um, it, it was a complete um, shift in the way you know, we were doing business. And again, I mentioned before, building relationships with others inside the organization, but um, even on our teams. And so we um, were all kind of learning together as we went along. And some things that I, I've found to be helpful is, um, and, and of course, every, I think, executive you talk to about this is going to say it's important to have your team of leaders in place that are able to really, you know, drive the um, uh, and sponsor the type of environment and culture that you need for a remote work uh, engagement with your staff. Um, but then also to be able to have the ability to still bring them on site, you know, a couple times a year and be able to have the in-person, um, you know, uh, time that that's, I, th- I feel like is really important for them. We do a lot of, um, you know, huddles and uh, obviously for, for my leaders, you know, they're involved often uh, through Microsoft Teams or Zoom meetings. We um, have utilized Zoom in, in the sense of having like breakout rooms where, 
we'll have the, you know, our entire team come on, but then we're able to uh, create different breakout rooms where we can go in smaller groups. And so we've used that as an ability to kind of, um, instead of having such large groups of people where, you know, everybody's, you know, talking and we're able to get into smaller groups virtually and still be able to, you know, have some team building and um, some intentional conversations around things that might be going on. And that's been really helpful. Um, We're also getting ready to embark on something I'm really excited about for our entire HR team, which is kind of a lunch and learn series um, that, uh, I, th- I think will be really helpful for our teams, but we've, we transitioned recently to a new HR operating model and, um, you know, we're, we're still, you know, everybody's kind of learning what, what all the other HR functions are still doing. And so we're using that as an opportunity to come together for an hour for, I think, 13 straight weeks, um, every Friday and the team will jump on, um, the entire HR team and we'll give every HR, um, you know, team an opportunity to really showcase, you know, what their team's doing, what, what are they, um, you know, really proud of in terms of the work they're doing. Um, maybe some things that others aren't aware of, you know, and, and allow uh, the entire team to ask them questions. So some, those are some of the things that we've done, but, um, we, we personally, um, in terms of my, my leaders and I have not, um, had a desire to go back into the office. There have been other parts of our organization that have chosen to do that or even in a hybrid manner. Um, but our teams have, our productivity has went up, um, and our engagement has, has been very high as well. And I think our, you know, our entire team continues to give feedback that certainly with all the, the external market uh, factors that are going on, it's, it's really advantageous for them to be able to work from home. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that um, you hear that so much in terms of like the productivity, the engagement, um, because someone's, you know, they're not commuting. So they're not, you know, driving in for 30 minutes or an hour, you know, during mm-hmm. that time, they're, they're working during the time that's sl- uh, slated for work. And then have the time to be able to do other things, um, have the flexibility, you know, Hey, if I need to switch over a load of laundry real quick, that's something that I'm not, you know, (laughs) stressing about in the evening after, you know, driving back and forth to work. So, um, I, I think that, uh, you've just seen so much of that and think that those are, you know, the, the ways that you shared are certainly some very, um, you know, exciting ways to engage staff. And, you know, it's kind of more difficult, I guess, at, at, um, you know, maybe the level that, that you're at with such a large team. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, but I think that what you highlighted could be, um, executed at that larger level or even at a smaller team level, you know, a manager and five analysts, you know, maybe they're, you know, having a team building zoom every, you know, once a month or something, um, you know, or doing different things. And so I think that that's, mm-hmm. that's awesome. Um, yeah, at the, at the, the height of the pandemic, we, um, we actually got the entire team to get our, you know, all the, the total rewards, um, and ask HR teams together and, uh, we're able to you know, go into these breakout rooms and really do it intentionally to where we had the, uh, individuals that were on different teams coming together. They didn't know each other and that really helped. And, you know, asking how, having one leader in each of the breakout rooms to ask them questions, kind of each one of them would go around and answer the question, but the questions were open-ended, you know, to allow them to have dialogue about, um, their experiences or maybe some personal questions. Um, and the team really got to know each other better that way. Yeah, that that's awesome. That's awesome. Cause it, like you said, it's not just the relationships of, you know, the people who are directly impacting your work or directly on your team, but just anybody you encounter and being mm-hmm. able to kind of build that, like build that camaraderie and like that shared, um, like, cause, cause regardless if they work together on the same and, you know, same smaller team, they're part of the bigger team and then the bigger organization. Right. So building up that, that relationship, I think is that that's awesome. Um, so Michael, you did mention how you, um, you know, you mentioned doing the lunch and learn as Mm -hmm. a way to, you know, further engage staff, but then also to educate staff on the new HR, um, operation model. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that rolling that out was not something that happened overnight. And I'm sure that, you know, there might have been some, some easy buy-in. There might have been some reluctancy. Uh, and there might have been a lot of educating and explaining that needed to, 
to be done. So could you maybe walk us through your philosophy or approach to change management when you roll out a new initiative, especially something at that scale and how you gain buy-in and then how you deal with those who might be reluctant to the change? Yeah, that's a, um, it's a good question. And one that I think it's, it's obviously going back to the culture is going to be um, dependent upon what your culture looks like. And, um, and so in my experience, depending on what uh, company or organization I've worked for, um, you know, while the approach is similar in terms of the, the foundation, um, you know, there's different elements that you need to take into consideration. So for this particular uh, change, when you think about, you know, the, the massive um, change that an HR operating model has for the entire organization, we were also implementing uh <laughs> a new ERP system. So we were moving from loss into Oracle cloud. And so um, a lot of change management going on uh, across the entire organization. And these two were uh, two changes were kind of um, coming together for last January 1st as an implementation and go live. So um, a lot of change management effort there. We approached it as um, really from an organization standpoint, and HR partnered with supply chain and, and finance as well on this, but um, we really tried to engage early on in that uh, change um, once the decision was made, you know, so that the uh, our leadership teams across the organization as well as team members were aware of what the change was um, and would engage them often throughout that change with updates um, just so that they were aware of what was going on and um, knowing that the ultimate target may have, when we started the project, was a year and a half away. Uh, but, you know, throughout, we kept them updated and uh, engaged them, you know, when necessary um, at times. And so, you know, setting expectations, I think, is really important early on in the change management process so that you're able to um, really limit the impact once it happens to the individuals. Um, and then you know, I'm a, personally, I'm a uh, fan of the Cotter model um, where I think, you know, there's obviously different um, change management models out there, but um, you know, having kind of your, your team in place, I guess, of the, the, um, the change management um, sponsors and executive sponsors, and then your change agents. Um, we utilize those in terms of having them uh, planted within each of our ministries or hospitals so that they were specifically uh, aware of more, of the uh, detailed, you know, things that were going on with the project and closer to go live, even they function really as our change champions. If issues or things were bubbling up and while we had our larger go live support model, you know, they were involved in making sure that they could help out uh, within the local ministries and, and support that change as necessary. But we, we had a lot of, a lot of communication, um, it was necessary for you know us to get a buy-in on the front end. Um, the change uh, obviously is different uh, for different hospitals, like it is in many large-scale initiatives. Um, you know, and, and and sometimes that change looks different for one hospital versus another, and, and the, the team members there. So um, we went through and and um, really tried to you know engage each of them in conversation give them a platform to have open conversations about that change and what their concerns were um, and then would work through those concerns as they uh, boiled up to us so um, it was um, I know I've, I've talked to other health systems have gone through this uh, this magnitude of change certainly with an ERP implementation but I can say that the change management piece helped um, a lot and our go live went um, what I would consider pretty well. Um, obviously afterwards, the, the lingering, um, you know, I would say issues and things that, that came up with implementing a new system um, when you're changing your, both your operating model and, and your structure, as well as your uh, technology system at the same time, it is a lot of change. And so uh, we did have some, you know, things that we have to work through over the first couple of months of that implementation. But um, all in all, uh, from an HR perspective, we think it, it went pretty well. Awesome. Awesome. And yeah, no, that's, that sounds like a, a lot, you know, changing, mm -hmm. you know, changing a lot at one time, but, you know, really love, 
what you shared of like setting expectations early and then keeping people in the loop. Because I think that people get disengaged when they're not, you know, maybe you set the expectation early, but if you're not reaching out to them again until two weeks before go live, you know, (laughs) they're going to, they've already forgotten about it. And, you know, it's not something that's front of mind, right? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That email from a year and a half ago, you don't remember, right? So I think that that, that's an important piece to highlight. So thanks for sharing, Michael. Yeah. And, um, you know, I want to kind of transition more. So we talked about, you know, kind of people, culture, relationships earlier, and would like to talk a little bit about performance and personnel uh, management. Mm -hmm. I think in, in leadership, that's one of, you know, one of our key responsibilities Um, Mm -hmm. and and one thing that, um, I I think nobody necessarily looks forward to, uh, you know, when, when it's a negative conversation or performance management conversation, uh, but the impact that can be had, um, Mm -hmm. you know, from, from handling it correctly can be incredibly positive Mm -hmm. and helping others Mm -hmm. grow. Um, so I'm sure as a, you know, as a, uh, as an executive, you've probably handled every conversation perfectly, uh, never, never done anything wrong or looked back and, you know, regretted what was or wasn't said. <laughs> Only yeah. kidding. To, uh, to kind of bring that back down to earth. I know that those conversations can be intimidating for, especially for new leaders. And I don't mm-hmm. think that that, um, that nervous feeling ever a hundred percent goes away when you're having those sorts of conversations. So to, um, to shed light on kind of your, you know, how you approach it, but then maybe also your growth and having those sorts of conversations, Michael, could you share a time where maybe you had that conversation and you botched it or maybe botch mm. is a strong word, but maybe, you know, word. you're, you're regretting it afterwards. You didn't say yeah. something or, or something was said that, yeah that, um, you know, kind of created a, a, an, an alternative reaction than what you were hoping and kind of what you learned from it and how that's helped you approach those conversations, you know, now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I would say earlier in my career, one of the big learning curves for me was to, um, and, and, and this was a situation that occurred. So I think it's a good scenario for your question, which is, you know, I had a performance related conversation with uh, a leader of mine that reported to me and, um, you know, I was new to my leadership role at that time and he had been a leader for, gosh, at least 15 years. So there was a long standing, you know, um, behavior and um, sort of, uh, I guess, a tolerance for his behavior from the prior leader and um, which had not been addressed. And so when I moved into that role, you know, I, um, I did not sort of, you know, address that immediately. Um, and I waited, you know, uh, too long in hindsight to, to address those, um, kind of performance related, uh, behaviors. And so, uh, when that conversation did take place, I wouldn't say it, it was botched, but, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, the, the, the big learning for me was, you know, it was a shock to him, um, and certainly difficult for him to understand because those conversations hadn't taken place in, in the past. And so, um, to the extent that, you know, you're able to, as a leader, address those immediately and, you know, you want to be, you approach it in a, an authentic and, and, uh, be true to who you are as a person and, and a leader and not pretend to be someone you're not. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's important that, um, you know, you, and I learned this a lot from the military, you know, it's not personal. It's, it's, it's the job, right? It's a, we're, uh, from a professional standpoint, you're approaching it. Um, and we all have responsibilities. And, um, and so we have to really, you know, make sure that we're exhibiting the behaviors that we're expecting our staff to also, um, you know, perform as. So, that was, that was a big takeaway. Um, and, you know, uh, the conversations from that point got easier because I think the expectations then were in place. Um, and, um, you know, every time, you know, we would have future conversations, we knew that we were going to be candid and open with each other about it. That was one of the big kind of takeaways from, from that initial conversation and uh, what I heard from, from him, which is that, you know, we need to be uh, on the same page and uh, make sure that I'm, you know, telling him what, what I need from him and, and vice versa. So, um, 
you know, as a young leader, that was first time leading other leaders, you know, it does change a little bit. And, and, uh, you know, that, that's probably the, the one that comes to the mind the most. Awesome. Awesome. And, uh, you know, I, I definitely, um, you know, appreciate that because I think that not everyone recognizes, um, the shift that does occur when you're mm-hmm. leading individual contributors and you're coaching them versus now when you're coaching those leaders, like you're a few levels removed from the individual contributor. Mm-hmm. And there's, there's a different approach to it and a different responsibility because the, the impact that one person could have as an individual contributor, if they're not performing up to standard is probably going to be less than if that manager or that director isn't performing the standard. Um, so the impact is much larger. So um, being able to address that, you know, in a proactive uh, manner, you know, to, to limit the negative impact, I think is super helpful advice. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it is. And it's, you know, the, um, the team, you know, it's so important that the team sees the behaviors uh, that, you know, they're expected to have, you know, and supporting the rest of the organization uh, modeled and, and exhibited by the leaders. And so, um, you know, for me, it's especially, you know, moving into to this role um, here. I mean, it's with so much stress, you know, that we incur um, from the pandemic to, you know, so many other external factors in the labor markets and um, the turnover, you know, there's a, there's a lot that can um, encompass, you know, our teams at any one point in time. And, uh, for them to to remember that they have such an impact on the culture and on our teams, you know, based on how they respond and behave. It's, it's really important. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Michael, I think that's a good place to, uh, to cap off the episode. Um, you know, if people were inspired today by, by your story, by your, uh, your approach or anything that you shared, how can people in the audience reach out to you, Michael? Yeah, so uh, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn, um, and uh, I'd be happy to to talk with you there. Um, and you know, certainly, I want to also. I know I mentioned earlier, um, you know, being a veteran and having transitioned out outside of the the military to a civilian uh, position. I know that others can go through similar struggles. So if if anyone uh, listening to the podcast or you know anybody that um, could benefit from that, I'm I'm certainly happy to be a resource and. Um, if nothing else, kind of help it in navigating to someone else that may be able to help with that transition. Awesome. 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 And we will include your LinkedIn in our show notes. So that way it's easily uh, accessible by the audience. Uh, So Michael, just want to say thanks so much for being a guest on today's episode of the Tips for Team Building podcast, where our mission is to inspire and propel others along in their leadership journeys. Really enjoyed the opportunity to reconnect with you and share your wisdom with our audience and look forward to continuing the dialogue. Thanks, Jaden. Thanks for tuning in to the Tips for Team Building podcast, where we propel others along in their leadership journeys. If you enjoyed the show, would you please subscribe and leave a review wherever you listened? You can also visit www.spiritmco.com to find out more about how Spirit Consulting inspires virtuous leadership. We'll see you next time.